We continue our reading in the book of James today, the letter that he wrote as we reach chapter 2. So here is a reading from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 8 through 17. Hear now the word of the Lord. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom instead, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. May God bless the reading of this holy word today. All right, James covers a lot of big and deep ideas in this passage. So let's start from the beginning, or maybe a little bit before the beginning, actually. So like I said last week, James is writing this letter to Jewish people who heard about Jesus and became Christians. As Jews back then, they would have grown up and been taught to live their whole lives based on the Old Testament law found in the first five books of the Bible. And since there are so many laws in those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that whole section, that first chunk of the Bible, is simply called the law. Or you might have heard the Hebrew term for it, the Torah. Now, by the time of the New Testament, the Pharisees were the ones who enforced all those laws. So they helped people follow them and judged or punished people who didn't, like Jesus. He would regularly do things that didn't follow some of those strict Old Testament rules. So the Pharisees thought he was bad, wrong, and sinful. To their credit, the rules that he wasn't following are in the Bible. He, being the Son of God, just knew which ones weren't applicable anymore, and the Pharisees didn't believe him. Jesus' grace was a little too amazing for their tastes because he was bringing in a new way to live, not a life based on rules, not a life focused on how bad you are and you don't measure up, but a life where God's grace frees you from worry, frees you from caring about what other people think, a life that frees you from the baggage of your mistakes and imperfections, a life where you are loved no matter what. And that sounds pretty good, though it can be hard for some people to accept if you assume God is legalistic and judgmental, then hearing otherwise will rub you the wrong way. So James is trying to help his Jewish Christian readers move from that limited life based on religious laws that men enforced and into a life that is set free by grace. They still had their strict live by the rules or your bad mentality. So James uses language they can understand. They are used to following the law, capital L from the Old Testament. So James says to follow Jesus's law instead. 
In verse 12, he called it the law that gives freedom. So that's his way of describing a life of grace in ways his readers can understand. From the second half of verse 9 to verse 13 in our passage, James goes off on a little mini tangent to explain the difference in a life based on judgment law, jong jong, and a life based on grace, the law that gives freedom. And that distinction, that difference, is exactly what we were talking about on Wednesdays a few weeks ago when we did Bible studies based on Les Miserables. There will be singing. We asked, do you want your life to be based on grace, like Jean Valjean is in the story of Les Miserables? Or do you want your life based on judgment, like Javert's was in the story? And at one point in the Les Miserables story, Javert said, Jean Valjean is a thief. People are either lawbreakers or law abiders. In his mind, you are only this or you are only that. Only black or white. Lawbreaker or law abider and nothing else matters. Javert has never felt or shown grace. He has only felt shame, which leads him to show judgment. So he wants to judge Jean Valjean in the story and never stops hunting him to try and throw him in prison. And so that's why Javert sings, and so it has been, and so it is written on the doorway to paradise that those who falter and those who fall must pay the price. Lord, let me find him that I may see him safe behind bars. I will never rest till then. This I swear, this I swear by the stars. Ugh, he's so angry, is Javert. So dark, like he's from the DC universe. Javert does not have a happy life because his life is based on judgment. Jean Valjean, though, he receives incredible grace in the story of Les Miserables by a priest that he meets. When Valjean was desperate, he tried to steal the church's silver, and it would have put him back in jail, ruining his life. But the priest forgives him, and that grace turns Valjean from a victim in need of restitution and empowers him to be a person who gives grace to others. And so the priest sings to him, and remember this, my brother, see in this some higher plan. You must use this precious silver to become an honest man. By the witness of the martyrs, by the passion and the blood, God has raised you out of darkness. I have bought your soul for God. So from then on, Jean Valjean chooses to live a life based on grace and not on judgment. And we can too. Or not. We can still have a life based on rules and perfection and judgment if we want to, like Javert and the Pharisees did. And if so, then that Old Testament way of living can judge you too. And life will never be fully joyful because shame will always haunt you. So instead of living under judgment like that, James and Jesus want us to live by grace, the law that gives freedom. Now, don't get us wrong, me and James. 
that law that gives freedom, it does have standards for sure, high and holy standards that we are called to reach towards, to grow into, to always be striving for. But it also has mercy. Now, if you're not into mercy and only judgment, then God can accommodate you and give you lots of judgment too. James says in verse 13, nobody's perfect. And even if you're always able to follow a lot of the rules perfectly, there will still be something that trips you up because we all slip up sometimes. So if you live by no mercy and all judgment, then you will suffer under that judgment, even here on earth first, because it is a sad way to live. God will honor your choice. Do you prefer judgment? Okay, you can have judgment. Now, obviously, God wants us to choose a life of grace so that we can receive the mercy and forgiveness that God is waiting and wanting to show us. And like James says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Judgment and the law work to control, but grace and mercy work to set us free. The law wants to restrict people, while grace wants to pull people up, up to a holier level of righteousness as we grow and mature. The law leaves us feeling shame, while grace leaves us feeling love. Not only does James call grace the law that gives freedom, but he gives a great example of it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's a great example because that instruction appears throughout the Bible. Leviticus 19, 18, Matthew 19, 19, Matthew 22, 39, Mark 12, 31, Luke 10, 27, Romans 13, 9, Galatians 5, 14, and then here in James 2, 8. So lots of places. It's an important instruction. That's why James calls it the royal law found in Scripture. Not just some great advice from the Bible, but royal law. Not human laws, not like the weird cleanliness and purity laws in the Old Testament that the Pharisees enforced. No, this is a lot more important than that. This is of a higher royal standard. So James says, if you keep reaching for that, you are doing right. Love your neighbor as yourself. And notice that it doesn't say, love your best neighbor as yourself. Or it didn't say, love your nicest neighbor as yourself, or just love the neighbor that agrees with you as yourself, tempting though it may be. No, it says, love your neighbor as yourself, period, period. And that's why James talks about favoritism in verse nine. Just love your neighbor, period, whoever it is, all your neighbors. Showing favoritism then, James says, would be a sin. And sin is missing the mark. So if you favor one person over another, one group of people over another, or one group of people under another, then you are missing the mark of God's standard for how you should act. I'll let you come up with your own examples for that. But anytime someone talks about those people or making sure that they don't get more than what I think they deserve, that should be a red flag to you 
It is favoritism in action because it is putting some kinds of people above or below other kinds of people. And that's also evidence of a life based on judgment because favoritism is judgment. You're judging one kind of person to be better than another. So you treat them nice, whereas other people, well, they're not as valued, not as good, not as special, not as right. So you don't treat them as nice. James says, don't do that. It's a sin. Instead, live by grace and put your faith in action. That's what he starts talking about in verse 14, putting your faith into action in the real world, having a real life faith. So James gives some real world examples of what faith should and shouldn't look like. He says, you can't just preach at people, but do nothing to help their actual lives and then expect them to listen to you. If you do want someone to listen to what you have to say, then you have to earn their hearing. And you earn it by showing that you actually care about them. To do otherwise shows an uncaring insensitivity and a lack of awareness. Like if someone was starving on the street and you just gave them a pamphlet that said, Jesus loves you, but then you kept walking along, what good does that do? No good. No good at all. In fact, it does harm because you, us, we are the body of Christ in the world. Christ has no body but yours. So if we tell someone Jesus loves them, but then we let them suffer, or we exclude them, or we say hurtful things about them, all we've done is give Jesus a bad name. Two weeks, two weeks ago in worship here, we got to uh, listen to Joe Yelton speak to us a little bit. Joe was the pastor of Hominy Baptist Church and now helps with ABCCM, Asheville Buncombe Community Christian Ministries. And while he was speaking, he mentioned a good quote by the preacher and author, Brian McLaren. Apparently one time, Brian McLaren was asked, why is the church in America in such decline? And he answered, I think the church is in trouble because our speech has extended beyond our actions. And that's what James is warning us against. Don't let your holy speech extend beyond your actual actions. Instead, have a real life faith. If someone doesn't have enough clothes or food, there's not much of a point in telling them that God loves them or Jesus died for them. Those are true and very nice things to say, but it's hard to feel God's peace if you're homeless, you know? It's hard to connect with God if you're not comfortable on a basic level. So don't let your high and mighty speech extend beyond your actual actions. James says that kind of faith is dead. It's not really even faith. It's just empty. If you do nothing about people's physical needs, James said, then what good is it? Answer, no good at all. Because it helps nobody. It just helps the speaker feel so good about themselves because they told that poor person about Jesus. James is saying, don't do that. If you're not going to do anything to actually help improve people's lives, if you're just going to work to get what you want, then keep your mouth shut. Don't tell people you follow Jesus since you're not actually following him. You're just talking about him. That's what a lot of the Christian voices I hear in the media and the news are like. 
They're just talking. And when they talk, it feels like I can see James uh, shaking his head and saying, haven't you read my book in the Bible? I know it's near the end, but it's really good. Our world is in need, physical needs and spiritual needs. Physically, different people will have different needs. So we got to get to know them and figure out how we can help. Spiritually, we all need grace to know and feel that forgiveness. More grace and less judgment. People are yearning for that. They might not even know that that is what they need. They're not hearing it in most churches, so they are leaving churches in droves. But deep down inside, everyone is desperate for God's grace. So again, it reminds me of a song from Les Miserables. It's the very last song of the musical. Do you hear the people sing, lost in the valley of the night? It is the music of a people who are climbing to the light. For the wretched of the earth, there is a flame that never dies. Even the darkest nights will end when the sun will rise. We will live again in freedom in the garden of the Lord. We will walk behind the plowshare. We will put away the sword. The chain will be broken and all men will have their reward. Will you join in our crusade? Who will be strong and stand with me? Somewhere beyond this barricade, is there a world you long to see? Do you hear the people sing? Say, do you hear the distant drums? It is a future that we bring when tomorrow comes. People are crying out for grace deep in their souls because they are lost in the valley of the night. And we know the good news. We have felt it and it has changed us and we get to live in that freedom. So let us Spread that good news. Share that grace with others so that they can know and feel it and be set free. Let us pray. Oh God, we confess that so often we have lived our lives based on the rules and standards and expectations that we have set or that we have let others set for ourselves and it has kept us down it has restricted us and it has only left us with shame oh god please break open our hearts so that we will let your grace pour in and set us free so that we can walk tall and proud, knowing that we are not perfect, we have made mistakes, but through your grace, we can shine your light brightly. Remind us, O oh God, that we can carry within our weak and broken hearts the all-surpassing power that comes from you. So we pray for us that we would let your grace set us free and we pray for others that we might share it with a world that is truly in need of hearing. In your name we pray. Amen.